crimson velvet roses gnawed at my sanity. Dozens of them dripping dew onto the worn mahogany coffee table, their scent clogging the air like cloying perfume. Each petal mirrored the raw ache in my throat, pulsing with the ghost of promises never kept. It was Valentine's Day, and in my studio apartment they mocked me like silent accusers. Three years ago, on this very day, Liam had declared his love under the Eiffel Tower, the sign twinkling like a promise beside us. A year later, the roses withered as he ghosted me through a single text. Maybe this year, I whispered, staring at the petals. A hollow laugh escaped, echoing in the emptiness. Of course, this year wouldn't be different. Hope. A flickering butterfly took flight in my chest. Perhaps a delivery gone wrong. A surprise gift from a generous neighbor. But the man outside wasn't a neighbor. He was tall, gaunt, with eyes the color of storm clouds. Single crimson rose, its stem dripping black liquid, was tucked behind his ear. Ms. Evelyn Thorne? His voice was a rough rasp, like sandpaper against bone. My breath hitched. Y yes A delivery for you, he said, offering the rose. Something about him, the chilling glint in his eyes, sent a shiver down my spine. But the familiar loneliness, the desperation for connection, urged me forward. I reached for the rose, my fingers grazing the black ichor that stained its stem. He chuckled a low, unsettling sound. <laughs> Enjoy the gift, Ms. Thorne. It blooms only for you. Before I could question him further, he turned and melted into the shadows, leaving me alone with the nightmarish rose. Curiosity, morbid and twisted, tugged at me. I brought the flower closer, inhaling its cloying, metallic scent. It throbbed, a grotesque pulse against my palm. Then, with a sickeningly wet pop, the rose's bud split open. Not delicate petals, but pale, fleshy fingers curled out, gripping my skin. A scream ripped from my throat as it latched onto my hand, burrowing beneath the flesh. Agony pulsed through me, white hot and blinding. I tore the thing away, flinging it across the room. It landed on the coffee table, its tiny limbs writhing, the black ichor oozing from its wounds. But even on the table, it pulsed, connected to me by an invisible cord of pain. Panic choked me. I ripped open drawers, searching for something, anything, to destroy it. A knife, a lighter, anything to sever the connection, the agony. My desperate cries echoed in the sterile space. Finally, in the back of a dusty drawer, I found it. An old vial filled with a clear liquid, a memento from my late grandmother, a renowned herbalist. She called it Tears of Willow. With trembling hands, I splashed the liquid on the writhing creature, and it disintegrated into a pile of dust. The pain receded, leaving behind a phantom throb and a chilling dread. Collapsing onto the floor, I cradled my throbbing hand, the memory of the tiny, flesh-hungry fingers imprinted on my skin. Outside, the city hummed with celebrations, a cruel symphony against the horrors witnessed within my four walls. Sleep didn't come, only restless nightmares filled with writhing roses and cold, storm-cloud eyes. Morning found me drawn magnetically back to the coffee table. The dust from the destroyed rose lay undisturbed, but the black ichor had spread, forming intricate symbols on the wood. My heart hammered. I recognized the symbols. Ancient, forbidden script from one of my grandmother's books detailing rites of dark magic, rites of sacrifice, of transference. A cold realization gripped me. The rose, the delivery, the storm cloud eyes that mirrored Liam's. Then I remembered. My birthday was one day before Valentine's, a detail I'd often mentioned to Liam. He knew. 
He'd orchestrated this. Using my loneliness, my desperation, as a twisted offering. The city outside, with its red decorations and forced cheer, suddenly felt suffocating. My sanctuary, my studio, now bore the scars of a nightmare. But fear wouldn't save me. This wasn't a love story gone wrong, it was a twisted game of vengeance. One I was now forced to play. I scoured Liam's online profiles, old social media accounts, anything that might reveal his whereabouts. Days bled into nights, fueled by coffee and paranoia. Finally, a clue. A grainy photo with the unmistakable silhouette of an abandoned church in the background. The church, shrouded in mist and silence, felt less like a holy space and more like a mausoleum. Inside, the pews lay dusty, the air thick with incense and something akin to rot. A single red rose wilted on the altar, its stem an oozing wound. Following an almost imperceptible trail of black ichor, I reached the crypt behind the altar. The air grew colder, and a low whisper, Liam's voice, echoed through the stone walls. Panic gnawed at me, but I gripped the vial tighter, pushing open the creaking door. Liam stood hunched over a pentagram drawn in charcoal, his eyes glazed with madness. Crimson candles cast grotesque shadows on his face, etched with a twisted satisfaction. In the center of the pentagram, bound by thorny vines, was a woman. Sarah, Liam's ex-girlfriend, the one he supposedly ghosted me for. Evelyn, Liam hissed, a cruel smile twisting his lips. Come to join the party? His words confirmed my worst suspicions. This wasn't just about me. It was about feeding his insatiable hunger. Not quite, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. I came to finish your little game. I flung the vial at the pentagram. The willow tears hit the ground like liquid sunlight, dissolving the charcoal lines and sending tendrils of emerald light across the crypt. Sarah gasped, the thorny vines around her loosening. Liam screamed, recoiling as the light reached him, burning away the dark magic that had fueled his twisted desires. He stumbled back, the madness draining from his eyes, replaced by stark terror. It was like watching a monster shrink back into the man he once was, and the sight fueled my rage. Why, Liam? I choked, the question raw in my throat. He cowered mumbling about lost love and a desperate need to prove something. His justifications were pathetic, mere echoes of a mind corrupted by his own darkness. In that moment, I realized pity held no place in this crypt. There was only justice, cold and swift. Grabbing a fallen candelabra, I raised it over my head. He didn't beg, didn't fight, he just closed his eyes. Just as I was about to end him, a voice ripped through the crypt's silence. Sarah, freed from the thorns, stumbled toward us, her eyes wild. No, Evelyn, she cried, don't become like him. Her plea hung heavy in the air, a reminder of the darkness I teetered on the edge of. Liam deserved punishment, but my revenge wouldn't erase the scars he'd left on us both. Lowering the candelabra, I watched as Sarah, shaken but alive, stumbled towards Liam. Their reunion was messy, filled with tears and accusations, but it was theirs to navigate. As for me, I turned and walked away, the emerald light of the willow tears painting my path out of the darkness. This story was submitted by one of the subscribers of our Broccoli fam, Jacqueline. Special thanks to her for sharing her story. Kudos to her for being an awesome person and staying strong through all these years. When my ex-boyfriend Mike texted me to see if I'd be willing to come over and talk, I tried not to think much of it. We broke up three years ago, so I was curious to see what it was all about. 
maybe he wanted to catch up with me. Or things didn't work out with his ex-wife, who he went back to when he broke it off with me. Mike and I met in high school and dated on and off since then. So we've known each other for about 20 years and spent 11 years in a relationship. During one of the periods when we weren't together, he met Haley. They fell in love, got married, and had two kids. Unfortunately, Haley didn't turn out to be the most stable person, or mom, so Mike ended up leaving her. When they went to court, Haley lost custody of her kids because at the time she was deep in addiction. After he left her, Mike and I reconnected and picked things back up. When I came back into the picture, Mike's two kids were about three and five years old. He struggled to provide for them and be a present father, so I stepped in to help. It was my pleasure. I loved Mike, so loving and caring for his kids was easy. For six years, I helped raise those two kids. I made sure they had nice clothes to wear to school, packed their lunches, helped with their homework, comforted them when they had nightmares, and tried to show up for them as I could. When their mom learned that I stepped up when she couldn't, she began sending me these horrible, hateful messages. She went as far as to threaten my life for raising her kids. Mike told me not to worry about her and that she wouldn't bother us per court order. Haley posed no issue for us until three years ago when Mike decided to get back together with her so his kids could have their real mom back. It broke my heart for him to leave, but I guess I can understand that he wanted to reunite his kids with their biological mom. When he told me we needed to break up, he stressed that he didn't really want to get back together with Haley, but it seemed like the right thing for his kids. Apparently, Haley had done a lot of work to get clean to be in her kids' lives once again. It was difficult to let go of him and those kids, but I don't care to be where I'm not wanted. So when he texted me out of the blue a couple of weeks ago to talk, it surprised me. The last I'd heard, he was still with his ex, who despised me, so what could we have to talk about? Since we've known each other for so long, I agreed. I got ready for the day and headed over to his place. I walked up to his door and knocked. He opened the door with a sigh. Hey, Jackie. Mike, I responded. He invited me in and offered to sit at his kitchen table. Any chance you have a cigarette to spare? He asked. I checked my pack, and I, in fact, did not. I only had two left in the pack. Would you mind if I ran to the corner store to get a new pack? Yeah, do what you need to do, he told me. I rushed out the door and walked to the store. I bought two packs and headed back. This time, I lightly knocked and opened the door myself. I walked into the kitchen to see Haley had joined Mike at the table. She glared at me like a lion hunting prey. Well, well, well. If it isn't the woman who tried to replace me, Haley started. Can we please not do this? I said. Mike said, can you please sit down and talk with us? Absolutely not. Not with that unhinged bitch, I said, backing up. I started towards the door and almost made it when a hand reached into my hair and yanked me back. Haley wrapped her other arm around my neck and dragged me back into the kitchen. With one hand, I pulled her arm down, which had me in a chokehold so I could breathe, and I used my other to punch her in the face. She recoiled back at this blow. Before I could make it out, she grabbed my arm and with all her strength whipped me onto the couch. She straddled me and wrapped her hands around my throat, completely cutting off airflow. I struggled to breathe and tried to push her face to get her away from me, but she was stronger. The more I fought back, the tighter her grip got. I couldn't even think of Mike, who was just watching this all happen. He just sat back and watched as his deranged ex-wife was killing me. I genuinely thought that was it. I was going to die at the hands of a mother who was mad at me for stepping in when she was unfit. Just as I started to see black, I heard Mike say, Let her go, Haley. Haley listened to his command, and air rushed back into my lungs. She climbed off me and spat on me as I lay there gasping for breath. She reached her hand into my pocket to grab my phone. I'll give this back after you talk to us. 
don't want you recording me or anything, she sneered. They sat back down at the kitchen table and waited for me. Slowly, I stood up and walked over, holding my throat. She had gripped my throat so tightly that my voice was raspy. <laughs> what do you guys want? Haley launched into an angry monologue, demanding to know what gave me the right to raise her kids for those six years. I kept looking at Mike, who needed the help, but he sat there silently. He let her choke me, and now he let her verbally rip me to shreds. I sat there for 40 minutes listening to her go on and on about how wrong it was for me to raise her kids instead of her. I urged her to see reason that I was merely helping Mike. It's not like I tried to file for custody of her kids. I just stepped in when they needed help. Haley kept interrupting me with her nonsense. Once she got it out of her system, I said, Okay, can I go now? The two nodded their heads, and Haley gave me back my phone. Before I left, I turned to Mike and said, Do not contact me again. I shook my head at Haley and left. In the days following, dark bruises formed around my neck. I had to use foundation to try to cover them up for work so people wouldn't ask me what had happened. I expected that kind of behavior from Haley, but I was disturbed that Mike let her ambush me. He just stood there, watching her strangle me for at least three minutes. He watched me struggle to breathe, trying to push her off, and he could have stopped at any time. Why wait as long as he did? This is a man I've known since we were teenagers. I had loved him at one point, and he loved me. I trusted him enough to come over when he requested to talk. Just goes to show you never really know someone. If you want your story with your animated avatar to be featured on the channel, send an email to broccolianimations at gmail.com. On to the next story now. My girlfriend passed away just over a year ago. It had been sudden, unexpected, as these things always were. She left one afternoon to get gas and never came home. It tore me apart. We had been dating for almost a year at that point and I really thought we were going to be forever. But it didn't happen like that. Those dreams were crushed in a heartbeat, in a crunch of metal and glass. It took me a long time to get past it. The silence, the absence in my heart. I felt guilty about moving on. I thought I would never be able to get past that part of my life, that I would be clinging onto these memories forever. But eventually, I realized that there was no point clutching on that grief. I had to let it go eventually. I got tired of coming home to an empty apartment. I got tired of the silent days and lonely nights. It wasn't healthy for me. Eventually, my friend suggested dating again. At first, I was against it. I felt like I would be betraying Alyssa by falling in love with someone else. But then, one night when I was feeling lost and a little bit lonely, I downloaded Hinge. I'd met Alyssa at a bar, so this was my first time using a dating app. I told myself there was no pressure. If I didn't hit it off with anyone, it wouldn't be the end of the world. I was used to being on my own. I set up a profile and then went to bed, leaving my phone on the table beside me. I didn't expect to receive any notifications, but when I woke up, I had one from Hinge. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I sat up in bed and pulled down my notification tab. Alyssa liked you. Match to continue the conversation. I swallowed back the lump in my throat, staring down at the name. Alyssa. Was that just a coincidence? Or was fate playing a cruel trick on me? A strange feeling welled up my throat, and I swiped away the notification, putting my phone back down. Maybe this was a bad idea after all. I climbed out of bed and slipped into the bathroom, taking a hot shower to wash away that unpleasant feeling that had risen inside me. What were the odds that a girl called Alyssa was the first person to like my profile? Fate was cruel indeed. I toweled off and went downstairs to grab some breakfast. I was halfway down the landing when my phone pinged from the other room. I hesitated. It was probably nothing. But something compelled me to turn around and go check it. I jogged back to my room. The air inside was cold, like I had left the window open, even though they were all closed. I shivered. 
My phone was laying face down on the table where I had left it. When I turned it over, a message flashed up from Hinge. Alyssa sent you a message. I frowned. I didn't think users can message you unless you matched. Was I mistaken? Or was it some kind of glitch? Despite the uneasy tremble in my heart, I opened the app to see who this Alyssa was. When I clicked on her profile, I almost dropped the phone. My fingers shook. The picture attached to the profile was Alyssa. My Alyssa. Who had passed away in a car accident over a year ago. The photo was one I had never seen before, taken in a semi-dark room. But there was no doubt it was her. I still saw those soft brown eyes and high cheekbones in my dreams. Was someone playing a cruel prank on me? Did someone think it was funny to impersonate my dead girlfriend on a dating site? Some people had a horrible, twisted minds. I opened up the chat box. Hey Mark, did you miss me? My gut wrenched sharply as I typed out a reply. Whoever this is, leave me the hell alone. This isn't funny. You're sick. An ellipsis appeared under Alyssa's name, indicating she was typing on the other end. If this was one of my friends, I was going to find out which one and give them a piece of my mind. This was a horrible thing to do. What are you talking about? To me, Alyssa. Don't tell me you forgot about me already. I was caught between wanting to shout and wanting to cry. Alyssa died over a year ago. Whoever this is, you need to stop. There was a long pause between the next message, and I felt my knees wobble when it came. I'm not dead. With a hard, trembling breath, I closed the app and tossed the phone onto the bed, clutching my head in my hands. What the hell? Who would do something like this? Why would they do something like this? To mess with me? My phone pinged, but I ignored it. I decided I would delete the app later and forget any of this happened. For now, I needed to get something in my stomach before I threw up. I tried to forget about the app and the messages I had received, but it was on the back of my mind for the rest of the day. Who was behind the account? Why would they be messing with me like this? It didn't make sense. It had to be one of my friends. They were the only ones who knew I'd made a Hinge account. I hadn't checked my phone since that morning, and when I went upstairs to grab it, I had over 10 new notifications. All messages from Alyssa. I gritted my teeth, pulling up the chat. Mark? Are you there? I'm sorry if I upset you. I thought you would be happy to hear from me again. It's been so long, Mark. I miss you. Did you miss me? Please come back, Mark. It's really me, I promise. Don't you believe me? Are you there? Leave me the hell alone. I know this isn't Alyssa. It is me. Then where are you? The chat fell silent. I scoffed. Of course they couldn't answer that. Not without giving away the facade and revealing this all to be nothing but a lie. I don't know. Somewhere dark. Somewhere cold. A bitter taste filled my mouth, and for a moment, I had the image of Alyssa lying six feet beneath the earth, her fingers scrabbling weakly at the lid of her coffin, her voice hoarse as she cried to be let out. I hastily shook the image away. Alyssa was dead. She had been for over a year. There was zero possibility that she was alive. The person on the other side of the chat was an imposter. That was the only explanation. Please leave me alone. The chat fell silent and I sighed in relief. Maybe finally they would stop bothering me, dragging up those feelings of grief and loss I had tried so hard to forget. I clicked off the hinge app and was about to uninstall it when another message flashed up on the top of the screen. The air around me went cold, seeping into my bones like an unearthly chill. I can't do that. I'm already outside. My heart pounded like a drum against my ribs as I stared at the message, my mind struggling to process what I was reading. Alyssa was outside? How is that possible? She was dead, buried in the cold, unforgiving earth. A wave of terror washed over me, and I scrambled to my feet, my legs trembling beneath me. I rushed to the window, my eyes scanning the darkness outside, 
desperately searching for any sign of Alyssa. The backyard was empty, bathed in the eerie glow of the streetlights. There was no one there, no sign of movement, but the message from Alyssa was still there, etched on the screen of my phone, a chilling reminder of her presence. The silence of the night was deafening, broken only by the sound of my ragged breaths. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that a pair of unseen eyes were following my every move. Suddenly, a gust of cold wind swept through the room, causing the curtains to billow and the temperature to drop dramatically. I shivered involuntarily, a sense of dread creeping over me. As if in response to the chill, a message from Alyssa popped up on my phone. My heart leaped into my throat as I stared at the screen. I'm here, Mark, the message read. I've come back for you. I turned to flee, but my legs felt like lead, refusing to obey my commands. I watched in horror as the front door creaked open, revealing a shadowy figure. I screamed, but my nothing came out. It swarmed over me, the icy touch running all over my body. And then, there was nothing but darkness. I woke up in the morning, physically tired but mentally fresh. To this day, the events of that night confuse me. The shadow and its touch, it was definitely Alyssa, but not in the form that I knew. It was like the whole night she kept me happy. I wouldn't say that I wasn't scared. I was completely spooked out. But even during these moments of horror, I enjoyed each and every second. Tell me, my friends, was it just a dream? Or is my Alyssa truly there? Have you ever experienced something like this in life? February was one of the worst months for several reasons. It was right in the middle of winter and spring, and the weather could be unpredictable. Sunny one day, rainy and foggy the next, making it impossible to prepare for. It was the shortest month, which always threw me off for not adhering to the usual 30-31 days. People spent the whole month commercializing and celebrating Valentine's Day, which itself was a load of rubbish especially for a teenage boy like me. And finally, it was the month my sister drowned four years ago. She'd been swimming with her boyfriend in the local river in late February when the weather had turned warm and somehow the current had dragged her under. An unfortunate accident, everyone called it. The recklessness of the youth, as if it had been her fault. Every February since that day had been one long nightmare. It was like as soon as the month started, a switch turned in my brain and everything changed. I started getting night terrors, seeing things in the dark that shouldn't be there. Sometimes, I would wake up and felt like I couldn't breathe, like something was sitting on my chest. It happened every year, every February. Sleep became impossible. Paranoia crept in. I started seeing my sister's face everywhere I went. I started seeing her out of the corner of my eye, watching me across the street or from the edge of a mirror. I told myself it was just the grief, my brain manifesting loss in different ways. But this time, it was different. The first week of February passed quickly. I had a few restless nights, waking up to the sound of screaming that could have only come from my own mind. But the night terrors and sleep paralysis held off. At least until the second week. A few days before Valentine's, I woke up in the middle of the night feeling like I wasn't alone. My throat was bone dry and my chest felt heavy, like it was full of water. I tried to sit up but my body wouldn't obey. So I stared up at the ceiling, watching darkness encroach on my vision until I could finally lift my head. I looked around the room. A figure stood out in the corner. Veiled in shadow, I couldn't make out any features but my brain was telling me clearly that there was someone there. Fear gripped my chest, quickening my pulse. I told myself that it was just another night terror, that I was seeing things in the dark that weren't there, but that didn't stop it from feeling real. The fear was real, and so were the shadows. Swallowing thickly, I reached for the lamp beside my bed, my fingers fumbling to find the switch. As soon as I turned the lamp on, the figure in the corner disappeared. 
I breathed out a sigh of relief. It was nothing after all, just a trick of the light. Shaking my head, I switched the lamp back off. The shadow from before was back, only this time, it was closer. The figure stood at the very end of my bed, shadow scurrying across a featureless face. The figure stood motionless. I couldn't take my eyes off it, my heart racing in my chest. What was it? What did it want? With slow, strained movements, I turned the lamp back on again. The shadowy figure disappeared again and I sighed in relief. As long as I kept the light on, it couldn't get me. Right? I forced myself to calm down and try and fall back asleep. There's no use staying awake, fretting over something that couldn't hurt me. After some time, I must have eventually fallen back asleep, because the next time I woke up, the room was dark again. The light had been switched off. Almost immediately, my chest felt heavy, like something was sitting on it. I couldn't move. Every time I tried to breathe, I couldn't get enough oxygen and my head started to spin. A horrible, bitter taste coated my tongue, like dirt or silt. Then, it struck me. This is what my sister felt like when she drowned, when the water filled her lungs and she couldn't breathe. Something wet and cold touched my ankle then. Fingers, paled by death, crawled up my leg. In my head, I heard voices, gurgled and strained like someone was trying to speak underwater. He did this. He did this to me. The pressure on my chest grew heavier. Hands tightened around my ankles, and all of a sudden, I felt like I was being dragged underwater, my whole body going cold and numb in shock. This had to be a dream. This couldn't be real. He did this. That wet, gurgling voice whispered in my ear, icy breath touching my neck. Alice, is that you? I whispered, the words choking in my throat as I clawed against the darkness that smothered me. Alice? He did this to me. You have to tell them. I tried to look for her, but all I could see was pitch darkness. Somewhere in the distance, I heard water crashing against rocks. A distant, gurgling scream. I knew I was dreaming, but everything felt so real. Alice, where are you? He killed me. I sat up with a gasp, shaking and covered in sweat. The lamp in my room was still on. I was alone. No shadows. No water. No Alice. Just my own thudding hearts and panting breaths. A dream after all. But what had it meant? He killed me. That had been Alice's voice. The voice I heard every February in my dreams. But this time, it felt different, like she had really been speaking to me, warning me, desperate for me to know the truth, that her drowning hadn't been an accident after all. My sister Nancy won a free trip for two to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. It was some kind of call-in competition on the radio where she had to answer sports trivia or something. It included VIP passes to a couple parties and a three-night stay at one of the oldest hotels in the French Quarter. She was planning to go with her boyfriend Ben, but she had broken up with him just before the trip. So, she called me and asked if I wanted to go. I had a lot of work to do, but I couldn't pass up this kind of opportunity. I'd always wanted to see New Orleans, so I rescheduled things at my job and joined Nancy on the trip. When we got there, festivities were in full swing. We checked into the hotel and then started exploring the area. Guys were constantly offering us drinks and asking if we wanted to earn some beads. Nancy said yes to everything, but I was a little less confident. I guess my sister wanted to go crazy during the trip, especially after her breakup. I'd never seen her act so wild before. In the afternoon, 
there was a huge parade running through the streets. It passed right in front of our hotel. There were dancers and floats and people everywhere. It was total chaos, but it was also really fun. Then one particularly strange float passed by. Unlike all the others, it didn't have many decorations. It also wasn't colorful. The whole thing was a black and gray platform with six jazz musicians on it. They all had different instruments, and they were all wearing black. I don't know why that particular float creeped me out, but it seemed really out of place. As it passed us, the man playing the saxophone set his instrument down and started gesturing toward Nancy. He wanted her to join him on the top of the float. Nancy tried to shake her head no, but the man seemed pretty insistent. Nancy looked at me and said, why not? Then she walked closer and the man pulled her up onto the float. The other musicians continued playing and Nancy started to dance. At the time, it seemed like a fun little moment, even though the float seemed a little weird. But then, the float got farther down the street and Nancy tried to jump off. All the musicians stopped her from leaving. They were a bit far away, so I couldn't hear what she said, but it looked like she was telling them that she wanted to get off. The saxophone player again set down his instrument and held her in place. By then, the float turned onto another street and I lost track of them. I was all alone, even though I was surrounded by a crowd of people. I didn't know what to do. I knew that my sister could take care of herself, but I still had a very weird feeling. I pushed my way through the crowd and tried to get onto the street where the float had turned. But it took a while, and by the time I crossed through the other floats, they were gone. I tried to tell myself that everything was going to be okay. Mardi Gras was a big, crazy celebration, and you just have to go with the flow. So I went to a nearby cafe, which was a bit quieter than the street, and I tried to call my sister. She didn't answer. I texted her, but she still didn't answer. I didn't want to be out there by myself, so I decided to go back to the hotel room and wait for Nancy to get back. She never did. The party continued on the street for the rest of the day and into the night, and Nancy still hadn't returned. I texted her a bunch of times, but I still didn't get any response. By the middle of the night, I was really worried. I called my mom to ask her what to do, but she told me I was overreacting. Then I called two of Nancy's friends and got the same answer. I opened up my Instagram to try to find any other friends that I thought could give me some advice. That's when I noticed that Ben, her ex-boyfriend, had posted photos from the same parade. He was in New Orleans too. I knew that their big breakup had been pretty messy, so maybe he had something to do with her kidnapping. After all, why would he come all this way and not tell us about it? So I messaged him, asking where he was. I didn't want to talk to him directly because I was afraid of what I'd say. I also didn't want to accuse him outright. If he did have something to do with the kidnapping, it was best to get as much information out of him without making him angry. He texted me back right away, admitting that he'd come all this way to surprise my sister. She definitely looked surprised, I responded. He said he didn't understand, he hadn't seen her yet. I couldn't tell if he was lying. Why would he be honest about being here and then not tell me the truth about taking Nancy? And why would he even post photos from the parade at all? None of this made sense. I was about to text him again when he called me. He asked if he could speak to Nancy and I told him that she wasn't with me. What? He said. He sounded so surprised that I knew for sure he had nothing to do with her kidnapping. I figured I'd tell him the truth, so I explained what happened with that strange float at the parade. He asked me if the jazz musicians on the float were all wearing black, and I said yes. Then his voice got really panicked and he said that he'd read about a group of local kidnappers who all wear black and steal women away in the middle of big celebrations. He said that he didn't believe the stories, but it definitely sounded like Nancy was the group's latest victim. He told me that he knew exactly where the group was gathered. I demanded that he give me the location so I could call the police, and he told me no. He said that these men were way too dangerous to get the police involved. He said we'd have to pay them off ourselves. He gave me an address and told me to meet him there in 30 minutes. He said he'd bring the money to pay them off, but he didn't say how much. After he hung up the phone, I honestly didn't know what to do. Deep down, I believed he was telling me the truth and really wanted to help Nancy, but I wasn't 100% sure. 
I also didn't know if I could trust him to deal with such a serious situation. Ben was always kind of a goofball. That was one of the reasons why they broke up. Still, I didn't have a choice. I waited about 15 minutes and then headed out of the hotel to go to the address he'd given me. I ended up at a really old ornate cemetery within walking distance from the hotel. It was completely empty, but I was close enough to the main streets to still hear people partying in the distance. Hello? I called out. Ben? Nancy? No one answered. I walked among the giant tombstones and elevated graves. I'd never been more scared in my life. I really regretted not telling anyone else where I was going. And then, in the distance, I heard jazz music. The sounds were slowly getting louder, and I realized it was the same group of black-wearing musicians that had pulled Nancy onto their float. They were playing their instruments and walking between the graves. They walked right toward me. I thought about running, but then I'd never get any answers about what happened to my sister. So I just stood there, trying to look as confident as possible and waited for them to approach. Finally, they stopped right in front of me, still playing their music, and the saxophone player tossed two small objects at my feet. They all turned to me and walked back into the distance, their music fading away. I looked down at the ground and almost threw up. Right at my feet was the necklace that Nancy had been wearing. Right next to it was a single slip of paper with the message, he didn't bring enough money. I never saw my sister or her boyfriend ever again. I met Adam while working the late shift at the police station. It was a Friday night and I was in charge of manning the jail cells where we put those arrested for DUIs disorderly conduct, prostitute and those types of situations. The one where they're behind bars until one night when someone bails them out. My shift started at 10 p.m. By the time I reached the desk, there were already a few people who got caught. In the woman's cell was a single woman with a tight red dress, messy hair, and smeared makeup. I'd seen her before, so she took her usual seat and waited patiently for someone to bail her out. In the men's cell, there were two men. One must have been a bodybuilder or something. He was massive and covered in tattoos. The other guy hugged his knees in the corner opposite the big man. He was scrawny and clearly had never been incarcerated before. So he sat shaking like a leaf, watching the big man closely. The big man paid him no mind and conversed with the other guard about the Kansas City chief season. I wondered if the scrawny guy got caught with the woman in the red dress and that's how he ended up here. We got another one for you boys, said an officer walking in with a man dressed in all gray. I spoke up. What did he do? Rambling nonsense, crazy stuff to an old man at the bar. The old man thought he was insane so he called 911, but when we took him for a psych evaluation, he passed. They said he seemed a very sound mind, and they wondered if it was that old man who was causing issues. So why do we have to hold him? I asked. They still got him on disorderly conduct. The man in gray looked between the two of us and shrugged. Honestly, I have nowhere else to go, so I'm not complaining, he said. The officer led him to the men's cell, took off his handcuffs, and locked him in. Hey, big man. The man in gray smiled at his cellmate. The big man looked him up and down and puffed off his chest to intimidate him, but the man in gray just laughed and sat next to the trembling man. I had never seen someone dressed like this man. He wore a long gray tunic and gray pants, all linen, the tunic buttons on the far right side of his chest, and looked like what someone would wear in a Star Wars movie. He was pale and his hair was greasy. What's your name? He looked at me. I looked at my fellow officer and back at that man. Yeah, you. What's your name? I'm Adam. Tom. He continued to talk to me. He asked me questions about how long I'd been a cop and what had caused me to pursue this track. Honestly, he seemed very friendly and all there. So, what happened with that old man? I asked him. He rolled his eyes. I was explaining how I got here in my background. He didn't believe, which is fair. I'm used to that. I started talking about some of the things and people I've encountered. 
and I must have said something that triggered him because he went ballistic on me. Then he said something that pissed me off and I started yelling. I asked him what the man said that made him mad and Adam shook his head. Doesn't matter much now, does it? I'm the one locked up and he's probably cuddling up with his wife in a comfy bed somewhere. Something about him fascinated me. It's almost hard to explain, but I felt compelled to continue the conversation. How did you get here? I don't mean the incident with the old man. I mean, what did you tell him about how you got here? He sighed. He wouldn't believe me, man. I shrugged. Try me. He laughed. I'm from the future. Okay. I responded. You're right. I don't believe you. Seriously though, how did you get here? He looked into my eyes for a moment before opening his mouth. I am from the future. We were fighting the Russians when they took me hostage. Technically, I'm a prisoner of war. I know to you that will seem crazy. I think they've only had me for a week, so that's why I seem put together for a war prisoner. I laughed, but he continued. He went on to explain a 50-year war between America and Russia. It was kicked off when Russia dropped a nuclear bomb on Los Angeles. I asked what year he was from, and he said 2122. According to him, time travel is the new form of water torture in the future. They ask you questions, and if you don't comply, they send you back to a random point in the past for a few hours before bringing you back. Sometimes, you get dropped somewhere where something horrible happened. He told me how one guy ended up in Japan the day they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. He ran around panicking all day, but no one would listen to him. They all thought he was crazy. Another guy got dropped in a concentration camp. In that situation, they couldn't leave him there too long, or else the Nazis would have killed him. Then other times, like his current situation, they drop you somewhere harmless and you have to roam for hours until they bring you back. Adam went on to explain how slowly the constant parade of people who don't believe and time travelers start to make them question their own reality until they really do go crazy. People get to a point where they don't believe in themselves and are left in a confused state until they die. I mean, can that really happen just from people not believing you? Adam stood up and walked to the bar, so he stood across from me. He said, Has anyone thought you were genuinely crazy, but you weren't? Or has someone lied about you and other people believed them no matter what you said? Or maybe you've been in an abusive relationship where your partner gaslit you until you didn't trust yourself anymore. I shook my head. Adam continued, it's hard to describe to someone who has never experienced it. It's like anxiety on steroids. Never underestimate the power of belief, even if it is just a matter of people believing your word. When they don't, you begin to question it yourself, and you get caught in this spiral of not knowing whether they're right, or you have lost it, or they're all wrong. It's like being sucked into a mental black hole. Once it begins, it's inescapable unless all those who don't believe you change their stance. I hope you never understand that feeling. Take it from me, it is unpleasant. An officer walked in to relieve me of my duty so I could take lunch. I want to hear more when I get back, I told Adam. Do you believe me? He asked. I don't know, I answered. Even if he was crazy, he was compelling. When I returned from lunch, everyone was rushing around in a panic. I sat at the desk and swirled in my chair to pick up my conversation with Adam, but he wasn't there. I turned to my partner. Someone bail out that guy in gray? They think he escaped, but we have no record that he was brought in. What? I swear to God, I turned around for a second and then he was gone. We tried to put an APB out on him, but couldn't find his information. All the paperwork we did also vanished, I guess. He explained that they checked the security footage to know he was there. The moment he supposedly vanished, the camera glitched. In one frame, there he is. And in the next, nothing. I have a feeling that I know what happened, but no one would believe me if I told them. I wish I could have told Adam I believed him before they took him back. My sister Sally was staying at my apartment for a few days while her husband Benjamin was on a business trip. 
They'd only been married for less than a year, so she missed him a lot. I tried to cheer her up, but she kept thinking about Benjamin. On her first morning here, I decided to surprise her with donuts. There was a Dunkin' Donuts on the other side of town, so I drove there before Sally woke up. It was pretty far, but I knew that Dunkin' was her favorite. I went up to the counter and ordered a half dozen for us to share. I wanted to hurry back before Sally woke up, so I was in kind of a rush. It wasn't until after I gave the cashier my money that I noticed two people sitting in the back of the restaurant. When I turned to look, I was shocked to see it was Benjamin and some woman I'd never met before. Benjamin was looking away, trying to hide his face, but I knew it was him. He should have been out of town on his business trip. The only explanation I could think of was that he lied to my sister. He was cheating on her. I paid the woman and walked right over to their table. I asked Benjamin what he was doing there, and he said that he and his co-worker had dropped in to pick up some donuts for his work conference. I knew that was a bold-faced lie. They only had two donuts, one each, and both were already half-eaten. The woman he was with instantly turned red when she heard him lie to me. I guess that was the moment she realized that they've been caught. I was furious. Sally loved her husband more than anything, and knew that she wouldn't believe me if I told her the truth. So, I pulled out my phone and snapped a photo of the two of them sitting together. I didn't say anything else. I turned around and walked back to the counter, where my box of donuts was waiting for me. I grabbed them and hurried out of the restaurant. Benjamin shouted, Wait! as I left, but I didn't stop. I got into my car and just sat there for a long moment, trying to collect my thoughts. I knew that as soon as I got back home, I'd have to break the news to Sally, but I really didn't want to do that. I turned on the ignition and drove out of the parking lot. Once I got onto the street, I noticed that Benjamin's car was following me. He must have rushed out of the restaurant without me noticing. The roads were pretty empty at this time of morning, and his beat-up Nissan was the only other car on the road. He wasn't even trying to hide the fact that he was following me. He was speeding, and for a second, it felt like he was going to run me off the road. I sped up and so did he. We were both driving really fast. He started honking and flashing his lights. He wanted me to pull over. I didn't know Benjamin that well, but he always seemed like a calm, slightly boring guy. I'd never seen this side of him before. I'd also never been involved in a car chase before, and I was terrified. I felt my whole body jerk forward as he slammed into the back of my car. I lost control and skidded off the road. In less than a second, I crashed into a tree. It happened so fast, I didn't feel any pain but I guess I blacked out. When I came to, I was stuck behind an airbag. I couldn't see anything, and I felt my face throb. My nose had been broken on impact. I heard voices at my side, and I knew that it was Benjamin and that woman. Is she dead? I heard Benjamin say, I sure hope so. I felt his hand reach into my pocket and pull out my phone. He was deleting the photo that I'd taken. Then I heard a crunch and could only assume that he'd taken my phone and smashed it. What if she's still alive? Her voice sounded much more concerned than his. I couldn't tell if she was upset about what they'd done or just about the possibility of getting caught. Then I heard him comfort her and say that he'd handle the situation. After that, I felt Benjamin's hands grab my arm as he tried to pull me out of the wreckage. I was aching all over and I knew I didn't have the strength to fight him off. The only thing I could do was pretend to be dead as he pulled me out of the wreckage and then try to run off before he could kill me. I felt excruciating pain all through my body as he pulled me out and threw me onto the ground. It took all my mental strength to keep my eyes closed and pretend that I was already dead. I laid on the ground completely motionless as Benjamin told the woman that he'd be right back. He needed to get a rock. Now. I could hear the woman starting to cry. She was muttering something to herself, but I couldn't make out the words. I knew that this was my only chance to escape. Moving as fast as I could, I pushed myself off the ground and started limping back toward the road. Thankfully, the woman didn't try to grab me, but she screamed and got Benjamin's attention. I looked over my shoulder and saw him racing toward me as I sped up. 
There was a pretty steep incline along the edge of the road, and it was hard for me to keep going. One of my ankles was probably broken. Just as I reached the asphalt, Benjamin grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me back. I toppled down the incline and landed painfully on my broken ankle. I was in so much pain I could barely breathe. Benjamin stood over me and asked, Why do you have to take that photo? I tried to beg him to let me go, but no words came out. I tasted blood filling my mouth. Don't move, he said. It'll be easier that way. I watched in horror as he picked up a rock and raised it over his head. He was going to drop it right on my face. It was huge. It would have killed me instantly. I lost all hope. I knew that these were my last moments on earth. But before he could do it, the woman ran towards us and tackled Benjamin to the ground. The rock fell with a thud. Let me do this. Benjamin shouted in her face. If she lives, we're both going down. But people are watching? The woman said. Slowly, I raised my head and looked back toward the street. Several drivers had gotten out of their cars and were looking down on us from the sidewalk. They saw what Benjamin was trying to do. One of them was filming the whole thing on his phone. Without saying anything, Benjamin ran away, leaving the woman behind. The woman slowly raised both her hands, as if she was about to be arrested. I don't know what happened after that because I passed out from the pain. I woke up in the hospital. I must have been on some pretty strong pain medication because I was tingly all over. Sally sat next to my bed, but when she saw that I was awake, she jumped up. Are you okay? I think so. Sally told me that Benjamin was still missing. The police were looking for him and it was only a matter of time before he was caught. The woman he was with had already been arrested. Then, Sally started crying and said she was so sorry that her husband had done this to me. I told her it wasn't her fault. Sally grabbed the paper bag and pulled out a single donut. Here. This will make you feel better. I was so happy to be alive. I ate that donut in seconds. It was the best donut I'd ever eaten. My name is Joanne. I'm 28 years old and I just got out of a three year relationship. Things ended pretty badly so I was planning to just stay single for a while. But then I met Lori at a gay bar. She was a little older than me but she was absolutely gorgeous. We hit it off right away. After our second date, I knew that I was starting to have real feelings for her. I came out when I was a teenager so I'd only ever dated women. But Lori came from a pretty religious family. She married a man named Tom, and they were together for three years before she finally told him that she was a lesbian. She said that I was her first real girlfriend, so she'd really like to take things slow. We'd been seeing each other for about a month when Valentine's rolled around. I wanted to make the day special. I was hoping that we'd finally take our relationship to the next level. So I sent flowers to the real estate office where she worked and made dinner reservations for her favorite Italian restaurant. Things went really well at first. We got to the restaurant and had an amazing meal. But as we were leaving, Joanne's mood completely changed. She looked terrified. She grabbed me by the arm and practically dragged me back to the car. When we got in the car, Joanne locked all the doors and then pointed toward the side of the parking lot. She was pointing toward a man standing alone near the side of the building. That's Tom, my ex-husband. What's he doing here? He's following us. She sounded so scared. She turned on the car and started driving, but there was something wrong. It took us both a second to realize that all four tires were flat. I opened the door to get a better look and saw that someone had slashed her tires. I looked over to where Tom had been standing, but he wasn't there anymore. I pulled out my phone to call the police, but Lori grabbed it from me. We don't have any time. Come on. Before I could argue, she raced out of the car and started running toward the street. The only thing I could do was follow her. We both ran as fast as we could. Lori kept looking over her shoulder to see if Tom was chasing us. If he was, we couldn't see him. Eventually, Lori turned onto a side street and I followed. 
I was starting to get pretty scared. I'd never seen Lori this upset before. Now we were on a dark residential street with no one nearby. It didn't seem safe. She led me toward a two-story house at the end of the street. I thought she was going to knock on the door and ask for help, but instead, she pulled out a house key and rushed inside. I followed her in. Where are we? She explained that this was one of the houses that her real estate office was trying to sell. She thought this would be the safest place for us to wait. She locked the door behind her and told me to check the other locks. As I walked around the house, Lori explained that Tom had been following her all day. She'd spotted him outside her office and then again at an open house. He said he wanted to get back together with her, but she told him no. She worried that he was turning violent, and with her car's tire slashed, she was right. When I finished checking all the locks, I got back to the living room and gave Lori a big hug. I absolutely hated that we were stuck in a situation like this. I was scared, but I couldn't imagine how scared she must have felt. She got on her phone and called the police. I could only hear her side of the conversation, but it sounded like they were telling us to stay where we were and wait for an officer to arrive. She ended the call and then assured me that everything was going to be okay. She walked into the kitchen and came back with a glass of wine. She didn't drink, so I knew it was for me. She handed it to me and said it would help calm my nerves. Lori and I sat together. I drank some of the wine and finally started to feel safe again. That's when I realized that there was something strange about this house. If it was an empty house that she was trying to sell, then why did it have wine? Why were there magazines on the table and photos on the walls? I took a good look at the place. It definitely looked like it was a house where people lived. I noticed a giant crucifix on the wall, along with a bunch of pictures of Jesus and framed Bible quotes. Then, I looked closer at the family photos on the mantel, and I gasped. The photos were all of Lori and Tom. This wasn't a house Lori was trying to sell. This was Lori's house. The one she lived in, with her husband. I started to ask what was going on, but the words wouldn't come out of my mouth. I felt really woozy. Lori had put something in my drink. It looks like you figured it out. A bit too late, though. She laughed coldly. Then she explained that she was still married to Tom. They were very happy together. She nodded toward the crucifix on the wall, saying that she and her husband were deeply religious. They took it upon themselves to find wayward women, like me. They just wanted to help me. To fix me. She explained some other things too, but I could barely hear what she was saying. I was seconds away from passing out. I heard the front door unlock and saw Tom walk in. Lori had lied to me about everything. Our relationship has never been real. Nothing she told me was real. This whole night had been one long game that she and Tom were playing and I was the pawn. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I couldn't move. I kept trying to fight against the in my system, but it was no use. I fell asleep. I don't know how long I was out, but when I woke up, Lori was standing over me with a roll of duct tape. She was halfway through tying me to the couch. Tom stood off to the side, watching his wife and smiling in approval. He had a box in his hands. I had no idea what was inside or what they were planning to do to fix me. Is she awake? Tom asked. I quickly closed my eyes as Lori examined my face. I didn't want them to know that I had already woken up. Nope. Out like a light. Get ready. She was about to finish taping my wrist to the couch. It was now or never. I quickly raised my arm and punched Lori right in the face. From a sitting position, I wasn't able to use a lot of force. But Lori was still caught off guard. She fell backwards and landed hard on the glass coffee table. It shattered under her. Tom rushed forward to hold me down, but by the time he reached me, I was already standing. My feet were taped together, so I wasn't very steady. But I was able to grab him by the neck and squeeze until he couldn't breathe. He begged for me to stop, but his words could barely come out. I didn't stop. I kept squeezing and squeezing until he lost consciousness and fell onto the ground. Lori stood up. 
We were just trying to help you. Of course you were. Thank you so much. I used all the strength I had to punch her again. My fist connected with her nose, and she fell backwards, back onto the broken table. That gave me enough time to peel off the tape around my ankles and run out of there. I hid in a neighbor's yard and made a real call to the police. By the time they got there, the house was empty. Lori and her husband must have left out the back. The police found them two days later. I'm excited for the trial. Can't wait to testify against them. It's been over a month since this all happened, and I'm once again single. I have no complaints. My dad's parents died when I was really little, so I barely remember them. They were both extremely religious though. I remember their house being kind of depressing, with big pictures of Jesus on the walls. Honestly, I hadn't thought about them in years, especially since I was so close to my mom's parents. My dad died last year in a car accident. It came as a huge surprise. My brother Jared and I drove back to our hometown to help mom with the funeral. Honestly, it was pretty tough. Mom could barely function without dad around. The funeral was a small affair, but it was nice to see so many of my dad's work friends show up to pay their respects. Dad was a pretty solitary person, but people liked him a lot. I delivered the eulogy. As I told a couple funny stories about my dad, I looked out into the audience. I recognized all the people there except for an elderly couple sitting alone in the back of the church. They were both very tall and thin. Their expressions were blank the entire time. At the end of the services, Jared and I stood with our mom at the door to the church and thanked everyone for coming. The old couple were the last to leave. Mom was too busy crying to say anything, but I asked them how they knew my father. The woman just stood there in silence, but the man said that he was my grandfather. I didn't understand, so he explained that he and his wife had given my dad up for adoption when he was just a baby. The grandparents I had known weren't really his biological parents. I looked to my mom for confirmation, but she had already left to go clean herself up in the bathroom. The man stepped forward and gave me a big hug. He told me to call him Grandpa Jack. His wife hugged me too. She just said to call her Nana. It was an extremely awkward moment. I had so many questions for them, but I didn't know where to start. Eventually, Grandpa Jack gave me a paper with his phone number and told me to call him later so we could reconnect. Then they both left. Jared and I were completely shocked. When mom came back, we asked her if she'd known that dad was adopted. She said yes, but she didn't give us any other information. We went back to mom's house and ate some of the food that her neighbors had dropped off. The next day, Jared asked me if I wanted to call our grandparents and meet them for lunch. We had a lot of other things to worry about, but my curiosity got the best of me. I called the number and Grandpa Jack invited us both over to his house for dinner. I asked mom if that was okay and she said yes. She wanted some alone time anyway. A few hours later, Jared and I pulled up to an extremely nice house on the outskirts of the city. It was basically a mansion two stories with a giant yard and a big fountain in the front. Growing up, Jared and I didn't have a lot. We weren't poor or anything, but we knew that our parents sometimes struggled to provide for us. Honestly, it made me mad to know that we had such rich grandparents living in the same city who didn't do anything to help us. I noticed that Jared seemed even more upset than I was. He was still in a lot of debt from college and to think that his life would have been so much easier if our biological grandparents had helped out. But we both pushed past that and knocked on the door. This was our chance to reconnect, and we shouldn't focus on holding grudges. Nana instantly answered the door. She gave us both hugs and excitedly invited us inside. The inside of the house was even more impressive than the outside. These people were absolutely loaded. Nana led us through the entrance into some sort of grand dining room. A long table was already loaded up with all kinds of food. Grandpa Jack was sitting at the end of the table. He stood up when we entered and gave us both big hugs. I wasn't that hungry, but I felt pressured to sit at the table. Jared did the same. 
With the four of us sitting together, Jared started asking them all the questions that we needed to ask. Why did they give up our dad? Why didn't they reconnect with us before dad died? How did they want to fit into our lives going forward? Nana started to answer, but Grandpa Jack stopped her. He told us all to eat first, and then we could talk later. I didn't want to be rude, so I started eating. Jared didn't. He just sat there with his arms crossed over his chest. Grandpa Jack kept encouraging him to dig in, but Jared said that he wouldn't eat until they answered our questions. This led to a long moment of tension in the room. I ate a few more bites before I realized that I was the only one eating. My grandparents still stared at me and Jared still sat there sulking. Nana said they wouldn't tell us anything until Jared had a little food. She said she spent all day cooking trying to guilt him into eating. I could tell that she was lying though. They clearly had cooks and maids that did all the work. Jared was about to start eating when he looked over toward me and froze. Are you okay? He asked. I didn't realize anything was wrong until he said that. Then, I noticed that my face felt tingly and my eyes could barely stay open. I felt like I was going to pass out. The only explanation was that our grandparents had put something in the food. I tried to ask what was going on, but by then, I was so woozy that I couldn't even speak. What did you do? Jared screamed at Nana. Rather than offer an explanation, all she said was, you both could have eaten your food. She made it sound like it was Jared's fault that he wasn't <laughs> Jared grabbed my arm and tried to pull me out of my seat. Come on, he said. We have to get out of here. He guided me away from the table. I could barely walk, so he was dragging me along as fast as he could. Our grandparents didn't get out of their chairs. They acted like nothing was wrong. Before we reached the door, Three of their servants ran towards us from the hallway and wrestled Jared to the ground. Without his arms around me, I collapsed to the ground, too. I knew that soon, I'd pass out. With my eyes barely open, I watched as a servant kicked Jared until he stopped struggling. Grandpa Jack slowly walked towards us. He stood over me, looking down. He had a dark smile on his face. I'm sorry things had to get violent, he said. You see, your grandmother is very sick. She needs a kidney transplant from a blood relative. Please don't take it personally. Only one of you. He said something else too, but by that point, I had already passed out. When I finally woke up, I was sitting in my car on the side of the road. Jared sat next to me, but he hadn't woken up yet. I shook him awake. He was covered in cuts and bruises, and he looked extremely pale. I asked if he was okay, and it took him a second to respond. I don't feel right, he said. Slowly, he pulled up his shirt to reveal a long surgical scar on the side of his torso. Our grandparents had taken his kidney. I drove him straight to the hospital, where the doctor said that he'd be fine with just one kidney. She asked us what happened, and when we told her the whole story, she couldn't believe it. She called the police to report the organ theft, but they didn't do anything. Apparently, our grandparents have a lot of connections in the town, so no one is willing to investigate. We haven't heard from our grandparents since then. I guess they got what they wanted. Right now, we're just taking care of mom and trying to move on with our lives. She's the only real family we have. I'd always wanted to go to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. I'd seen videos of the crazy celebrations they have down there, and it seemed like such a cool experience. I never really had enough money to go though, so it was always just a dream. Then, last year, I got a call from Dan, my crazy friend from college. I hadn't heard from him in years. He asked if I wanted to go with him to a Mardi Gras festival. He said we could drive together. I lived in South California, so it seemed like a pretty long drive, but Dan said he wasn't planning to go to New Orleans. He wanted to take me to Lake Havasu, which is this desert town just a couple hours away. I guess they have Mardi Gras celebrations every year, and apparently they're just as wild and crazy as the ones in Louisiana. I said yes, of course. That was definitely in my budget. Besides, I hadn't seen Dan in forever, and I really wanted to reconnect. 
So he picked me up and we drove in his old Nissan through the desert. It didn't take me long until we made it to Lake Havasu. He'd gotten us a pretty cheap hotel near the lake, close to restaurants and clubs, and a dock where we could rent jet skis. You say I make you nervous, a tragedy, I'm a beautiful It was the day before the big celebration, but a huge party was already going on at our hotel pool. The pool overlooked the lake, and there were at least 50 people swimming and dancing, and doing the kind of stuff you'd see on Girls Gone Wild. It was intense. As the night wore on, I lost track of Dan in the crowd. I guess I drank too much because I ended up passed out near the pool. When I woke up the next day, I was back in my hotel room lying on the carpet. The sheets were tangled around me and my skin was sticky all over. I assumed it was vomit from all the alcohol, but when I looked down at my hands, I saw that both my hands were stained red. I was covered in blood. Even though I was still woozy and hungover, I jumped up and started freaking out. I looked all around the hotel room to find Dan, but he wasn't there. Then I heard the toilet flush and Dan casually walked out of the bathroom. He smiled at me and said, you owe me big time. I demanded to know what had happened last night. He casually sat on the couch and then motioned for me to join him. When I did, he told me all about the night before. He said that I'd gotten completely wasted and ran off with some girl down the beach. I stole some guy's boat to impress her, but then I couldn't get it started. She was pretty drunk too. While she was trying to figure out the engine, she got really close to the boat propellers. When I started the engine, the blades of the propellers caught onto her hair and pulled her under. In seconds, the girl was chopped to bits. I didn't say anything for a long moment. I thought he was joking. He was telling me this disgusting story in the most laid back, casual way possible. He had to be messing with me. But then he pulled out his phone and showed me pictures he'd taken of body parts floating in the water. I instantly threw up. Dan laughed. Dude, he said, you really can't handle your liquor. This had nothing to do with alcohol. Someone died. I killed someone and I don't remember. He patted me on the back and assured me that he took care of it. He found me in the boat, gathered up the girl's remains, and then took me to one of the islands on the other side of the lake to dispose of the body. Then he washed off all the blood on the boat, took me back to the hotel, and went to sleep. My head was pounding, especially my left ear. I felt like throwing up again. I screamed at him. How could this happen? You should have called the police. I screamed for a full minute before he punched me in the arm and said, It's okay, dude. It's Mardi Gras. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and started to call the police, but Dan snatched it away before I could finish dialing. He told me that if I called the police, we'd both get arrested. He said that no one was going to find the body for days, and by then, we'd be back in California. I tried to tell him that we needed to tell someone. Even if we got away with it, I couldn't live with the guilt. The poor woman probably had a family wondering where she was. You'll either feel guilty in prison or feel guilty as a free man, he told me. I think the second option's better. Then he laughed, like this was just some wacky party story. I didn't know what to do. I walked into the bathroom and took a shower. When I came back out, Dan had already shoved my blood-stained blankets into my suitcase so we could dispose of them later. He looked up at me and said, I think you should go down to the dock to see if you can remember anything from last night. I'll wait here. I agreed. I needed to sort through my thoughts. I passed by the pool where I'd first gotten drunk. Even though it was still early in the morning, there were a bunch of people swimming and drinking. I kept my head down and walked toward the lake. Thankfully, there were less people along the water. I tried to remember anything from the night before, but I couldn't. As I walked along the water, I saw a group of policemen up ahead. There were three of them, all inspecting a boat that wasn't properly tied to the dock. That must have been where the accident happened. I walked closer. I needed to see for myself. One of the policemen shouted for me to back up. I was too close to the scene of the crime. I backed up a little bit, but I was still close enough to have a look. There didn't seem to be any blood on the boat, but I saw the policeman shoving something into a clear evidence baggie. It was a small silver earring. 
I recognized it as one of Dan's earrings. He was wearing them from the night before. Horrified, I realized that the boat was probably filled with evidence that we'd left behind. Back away, the cop said again. I turned around and hurried away from the scene. I was suddenly really aware that my left ear was still throbbing. I touched up to it and felt something strange. I was wearing an earring, which was impossible because my ears weren't even pierced. I pulled the thing out and saw it was small and silver. It matched the one in the evidence bag. That's when I finally pieced everything together. Dan was the murderer, and he was trying to pin it on me. He went as far as piercing my ear while I was passed out and tricking me into wearing his earring as a way to incriminate me. Suddenly, I heard Dan's voice behind me. That's the murderer! He's returned to the scene of the crime! I spun around and saw Dan pointing right at me. This was all part of his plan. The policeman on the boat jumped up and ran toward me. They tackled me to the ground. As I was shoved face down against the sidewalk, they slipped the handcuffs on me. I could hear one of the policemen tell the other one about my earring. I twisted my head to the side and saw Dan standing behind the policeman, smiling at me. He knew that I'd finally figured out his plan, and he knew that he was going to get away with it. One of the cops walked over to him and asked him for a statement. As the others held me down, I could hear Dan lie to them, saying that he had witnessed me return to shore covered in blood. I felt so angry, so betrayed. Not only had he tried to convince me that I was a murderer, but he had convinced everyone else too. And then, the policeman told him something that I'll always remember. Thank you, sir. It's always better to have an eyewitness instead of just some security camera footage. The cop pointed toward a security camera fastened to the tree right over his head. It was pointing directly toward us, recording everything. And judging by the angle, it had recorded everything that Dan had done the night before. Dan's in prison now. I've moved on with my life. And I will never, ever celebrate Mardi Gras again. I just started my new job as a secretary for a mid-sized insurance company, and it wasn't going well. On my first day, I printed out the wrong packet for my boss Jonah's presentation, and he yelled at me in front of everyone. He said that if I made another mistake, I'd be fired. My coworkers told me that he usually wasn't this aggressive. Something must have happened in his personal life. I didn't care what his reason was, though. I didn't want to get on his bad side. For the rest of the week, Jonah watched me like a hawk. It was like he was waiting for me to screw up again. I needed to do something to get on his good side. I noticed that he often picked up Dunkin' Donuts for breakfast, so I decided that I'd go and pick up a dozen donuts for the office as a surprise. So, Friday morning, I got up early and headed to Dunkin' around 6.30. They had just opened and everything was really fresh. I ordered a dozen making sure I got a couple maple bars. Those were the ones that Jonah always ordered. The cashier was a young girl who seemed really nice. Her name tag said Hannah. She packed everything up and we talked for a little bit. I told her how stressed I was at my new job and she commensurated with me. She talked about how she just got out of a pretty bad relationship with a married man, but her life was much better now. As she handed me the order, she noticed the work uniform I was wearing and her face instantly dropped. That's where you work? It seemed like she knew something that I didn't. But when I asked her what was wrong, she handed me my donuts and told me not to worry. As I walked out of the restaurant, I saw Jonah pulling into the parking lot. I didn't want to ruin the surprise, so I ducked behind a car before he could see me. I watched him walk inside. Then I got in my car and drove straight to the office. Jonah ended up coming in an hour late. By then, most of the donuts had already been eaten, but I made sure to save one of the maple bars, just in case. For some reason, he seemed completely different. He was smiling and whistling to himself, like a huge weight had been lifted off his shoulders. The rest of the workday was pretty uneventful. My donut surprise didn't seem to impress Jonah at all, but he was still in a much better mood than before. He even thanked me when I gave him his mail. That night, 
I was watching the local news when I saw a report on a murder victim that had been found earlier in the day. They showed a picture of the girl, and it took me a second to recognize that it was Hannah, the girl from the donut shop. They said that her body had been found in a dumpster behind the restaurant. She had been murdered that morning, and the police had no leads. Whoever killed her had shut off the restaurant's security cameras. They were asking the public for any witnesses to come forward. I felt absolutely terrible. I might have been one of the last people to see her alive. I remember that Jonah was there too. Maybe he'd seen something. I thought about telling him that night, but I decided to wait until the morning. When I got to the office the next day, I could see Jonah was just as cheerful as he was the day before. It seemed like a good time to talk to him about Hannah, to see if he had any information that might be able to help the police. It was the two of us alone in his office. I asked him if he saw the news, and he said no. Then I admitted that I had seen him entering Dunkin' Donuts right after me. I asked him if he remembered the woman who was working there. His expression instantly went blank. He knew something about her murder. I tried to ask him what he knew, but he refused to tell me. Instead, he asked if I had talked to police yet. I shook my head no. I didn't have any specific information to give them, but maybe I had seen something important without realizing it. Jonah suggested that we both go to the police station together. I was glad that he seemed to be taking it as seriously as I did. He quickly got out of his chair and marched towards the elevators. I hurried to catch up. He said that we could both take our lunch early and we'd be back within the hour. He still wouldn't say what he knew about Hannah though. We rode the elevator for a couple floors before I realized that Jonah had pushed the wrong button. We weren't heading to the ground floor. We were headed toward the roof. I asked him what was going on and he said he just had a short errand to do first. He didn't say anything else. When the elevator door opened, he pulled me out onto the roof before I could push him away. By this point, I could see the insanity in his eyes. He was unhinged. He had just taken me to a place where no one could see or hear us. He reached back into the elevator and pushed all the buttons so that if I tried to go back down, I'd have to wait a long time before the elevator reached us. Jonah looked around to make sure no one else was nearby, and then he finally came clean. He said he'd been seeing Hannah for months. That's why he went to Dunkin' Donuts. Even though he was married, he had fallen madly in love with Hannah. When she rejected him, he couldn't stand it. So he murdered her and disposed of the body. I was disgusted. What he was saying and how he was saying it. He was smiling. He was proud of himself. And as he talked, he slowly stepped closer to me. I had to back away from him. What are you doing? I asked. He got even closer, his face inches from mine. There weren't supposed to be any witnesses. He growled at me. You killed her? I asked. He didn't answer, but his dark smile told me everything. He looked proud, triumphant. Then his expression dropped. I'm so sorry. You were actually one of our best employees. He reached forward, ready to push me off the building. I wish I'd gotten to know you better, he said. Then he slammed into my chest, expecting me to fall backwards, but I didn't. If he had gotten to know me, he would have known that I had been taking Taekwondo classes for over a decade. At the last second, I grabbed him by the wrists and twisted my body to the side. He didn't have enough time to stop, so without me in front of him, he toppled forward and fell over the edge. After two terrible seconds of silence, I heard him splat on the ground far below. I looked down and saw his body lying dead on the parking lot. His head was twisted all the way around. When the police came, I explained everything step by step. They didn't believe me at first, but when one of the officers unlocked his phone, he saw photos of Jonah and the Dunkin' Donuts girl together. That was the evidence they needed to let me go, though they still said they'd call me again if they needed more information. This all happened about a week ago. I'm still at the same company, 
And without Jonah as my boss, I'm starting to really like my job. My name is Jesse. I have a huge family and we always shower each other with gifts for all the holidays. I don't make a lot of money, so it's always difficult to find presents that aren't too expensive. The worst time of the year is February, because that's when three of my sisters and two of my nieces have their birthdays. I usually go shopping right after the holidays to try to find the best deals, but this year, I had to work over Christmas vacation, so I didn't have time to shop until the end of January. By then, all the best deals were over. I had to think of a group present that wasn't too expensive, so I went online and found a brand new escape room in my town. It didn't have any reviews yet, but the pictures looked appropriately spooky, and most importantly, it was cheap. I reserved six spots for me and all the girls having birthdays. I texted everyone that I was planning a group present and asked which date would work best for everyone. We settled on the Saturday after Valentine's. I arrived at the escape room first and instantly had regrets. It was located inside a big sketchy looking warehouse on the outskirts of the city with no signage or clear entrance. I was about to text everyone to cancel when a van pulled up with the rest of my family. My oldest sister, Nancy, got out first. She seemed really impressed with the place, like it was intentionally run down. They all started walking towards the building, and I was the last one to enter. We ended up inside a dingy waiting room with fluorescent lights flickering from the ceiling. There were dark red stains on the wall that definitely looked like dried blood. No one was there to greet us. I was surprised that everyone else seemed excited to be there. I was the only one who felt uncomfortable with the whole situation. When I had seen the photos online, I thought that the escape room had great decorations to make it look dangerous and off limits. I had no idea that there were no decorations. It was all just an old dilapidated building. An old woman walked in wearing a nurse's uniform. She silently handed each of us waivers that we had to sign, and then she walked out of the room. All my relatives signed the papers without even reading them, but I started scanning through mine. It said that the company wasn't responsible for death and dismemberment. I didn't like that. Before I could read the whole thing, Nancy nudged me and said that I should just sign it. These kinds of waivers were standard for escape rooms. I'd never been to a place like this, so I couldn't argue. I signed the waiver. Instantly, the nurse walked back into the room and silently snatched up all the signed contracts, and then she left again. We stood there for a bit, until the door in the back of the room swung open by itself. Nancy walked in first, of course, but the rest of us followed. We ended up in a room that was so dark, we couldn't see anything. Then the door shut behind us, and we were trapped inside. A single light bulb flickered on, and we could see that the only object in the room was a small box in the corner. Nancy excitedly ran over and opened it, but gasped when she saw what was inside. She pulled out a paper and read it to us. One of you must die before you can leave. Then she pulled out the other object in the box, a revolver. It looked so realistic, but Nancy was holding it like it was just some toy. I begged her to put it down, but she just laughed and pointed it right at me. Careful, she said, or you'll be the one who gets shot. Everyone laughed at that. I was horrified that I was the only one taking this seriously. I know that escape rooms are supposed to trick you, but the danger of this place felt so real. Nancy could tell that I was nervous, so she pointed the wall at the gun and fired, just to show me that it wasn't a real gun. To her surprise, a huge gunshot erupted and the bullet thunked into the wall. That was when everyone started to scream. Two of my sisters ran towards the door and tried to open it, but of course, we were locked inside. A voice came from an intercom, saying that we had 50 minutes to escape. I screamed for them to open the door, but nothing happened. 
it wouldn't budge. Then, the light bulb went off again. We all stood there in darkness, trying to figure out what to do. This wasn't a real escape room. We were in danger, and we had no idea who had planned this or what exactly they wanted to happen. I demanded to know who had the gun, and Nancy said that she was still holding it. One of our other sisters suggested that we start feeling around the room if there was any other objects that could help us get out. I heard noises and footsteps as everyone got to work feeling along the walls and on the floor. After five minutes of that, we realized that there was nothing else in the room, just the gun. A voice came on again, saying that we now had 45 minutes left. Then, the voice said something else that shook me to my core. It said that if we didn't choose one person to shoot, then none of us would get out of here alive. The message sounded deadly serious. I pulled out my phone to call the police, but the signal was blocked. My relatives all tried their phones too, but none of them worked. I felt like giving up. Whoever was keeping us here wanted us to turn on each other. I made my way back to the door and tried to figure out if there was another way to unlock it. I kept twisting on the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. I thought about trying to pick the lock, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to. Suddenly, I felt a hand touch my shoulder. Nancy had come up from behind me. You brought us here, she said. It's your fault. I tried apologizing to her. I had no idea that this would happen, but Nancy wasn't listening. In the darkness, I heard her cock the gun. She was aiming it at me. Don't shoot, I begged. Please, there has to be another way out of here. She wasn't listening. I heard some sniffling and I knew that she was crying. I also knew that she was going to shoot me. I dove out of the way just as she fired the gun. The bullet barely missed me, but the blast left a huge hole in the door. Light streamed in from the lobby. I was able to reach through the hole and start breaking off more of the door until I could open up the door from the other side. We opened the door and all ran outside. Everyone was visibly shaken and Nancy looked like she'd made the biggest mistake of her life. Tears were streaming down her face. I'm so sorry, she said. I was too numb to be mad. And besides, we made it out of the room and nobody had gotten hurt. I looked around for the nurse or anyone else, but the whole building seemed empty. We walked out of there and when we got far enough from the building, I called the police. They arrived five minutes later and Nancy showed them the gun. We explained what happened and the police searched the area, but they didn't find anyone nearby. And when they went online to look up the escape room, the website had been deleted. I know they're still investigating, but we still don't have any other answers. Who set up the escape room? What was their big plan? We might never know. All I know for certain is that I will never do an escape room again. Every summer, my sister Greta and I visited our grandparents in Minnesota. Even though they were both pretty old and sickly, they were great people. Grandma Pat would fix us some amazing meals. Grandpa Nick would show off his garden, and both of them would always surprise us with little practical jokes, like water buckets balanced on the door, or fake body parts buried in our guest beds. Despite their health, they were both young at heart. That's why I was so happy when they decided to move to a retirement community in Florida. The weather would be better for them, and they'd have a lot more opportunities to be social and active. We didn't visit them last year because they were still moving in. But this summer, Greta and I decided to fly down there and stay for a whole week. When our grandparents picked us up at the airports, they looked like completely different people. They seemed so much healthier now. Happy too. It was amazing how much they changed since we last saw them. As we drove to their place, Grandpa Nick asked us a lot of strange questions. He asked what we typically ate. He asked how much exercise we got in a week. He even asked if we were smokers. 
Greta was more than happy to tell them that I was a smoker and she wasn't. Grandma and Grandpa exchanged glances. It seemed like they really cared about living healthy now. When I got to their gated community, I couldn't believe how beautifully it was. All the houses were huge and every street had a view of the ocean. A bunch of their neighbors drove by us in golf carts. They were all just as old as our grandparents, but they also seemed very healthy and active. Everyone smiled and waved, and a few of them even invited us to their house for dinner while we were visiting. I had a really good feeling about this community. If everything was good as I thought it was, our parents would live long, happy lives. That night, I was deep asleep when Greta ran into my room and shook me awake. She looked scared. I asked her what was wrong and she said that Grandma Pat had snuck into her room and stood at the foot of her bed, staring at her as she slept. It sounded creepy, but I told her not to worry about it. Older people act strange sometimes, especially after sundown. Greta asked if she could sleep in my room, but I told her no. I didn't want her snoring to wake me up. The next morning, I woke up with an uneasy feeling. It was like I sensed something was wrong. I went to the kitchen where both my grandparents were eating breakfast. Greta wasn't there. I asked them where she was and Grandma Pat told me not to worry about it. She said that Greta had to leave early, but I was free to stay as long as I wanted. I knew that my grandma was lying to me. Greta would never leave in the middle of the night without telling me. Something had happened to her. I tried to reason with them, but Grandpa Nick told me to stop asking questions. He tried to get me to sit down and eat breakfast with them but I just left them there and ran to Greta's room. Her bed was made, which is something that Greta seldom did, and her luggage was gone. I also noticed that the bedroom window was wide open. Greta would never leave the window open like that. I made sure my grandparents couldn't hear me, and then I snuck through the window and into the backyard. I could see fresh marks on the ground. It looks like Greta had been dragged away. I followed the marks to the community center at the end of the streets. I passed an old lady who was watering her yard. She asked me how I was doing. I told her I was just fine. I didn't want to give her any other information. The woman kept staring at me, but I continued all the way to the community center. The door was unlocked, so I walked in and saw what looked like a giant hospital room. There were trays filled with medical equipment and several operating tables. Then I saw Greta tied to a table in the center of the room. Her mouth was gagged and she was barely moving. I pulled the gag out of her mouth and asked her what was going on. Help, she whispered. I think they took my kidney. I saw that her shirt was stained with blood. I pulled up the shirt to see a nasty scar across the side of her stomach. It was stitched together and very fresh. She was still bleeding. Help, she whispered again. And then... She passed out. That's when I finally pieced together the awful truth. This wasn't just a normal retirement community. Everyone here was healthy because they were stealing organs. And worst of all, my grandparents must have been in on it too. I tried to untie Greta, but the straps were pretty tight around her wrists. We needed to get out of there. Just as I had gotten one of her hands loose, I heard slow clapping from the door behind me. I turned around to see my grandma standing there. She was grinning darkly. You found her, she said. You're smarter than I thought. You're stealing organs? I asked. She walked farther into the room, still smiling widely. Grandpa Nick walked in behind her, but he didn't say anything. It's just a practical joke, Grandma Pat said. Your sister was in on it the whole time. I looked down at Greta to see if her dr state was just an act. I looked at the slice along her stomach too, and that sure looked real. Greta opened her mouth to say something, but nothing came out. Then, Grandpa walked over to the operating table and slid his finger along Greta's open wound. He licked the blood off his fingertip. It's just syrup, he said. It's all a big joke. Five or six of their neighbors walked into the room too. They were all smiling and laughing. You're all in on it? I asked them. That made everyone laugh even harder. As Grandma assured me that this was just some elaborate joke, Grandpa took Greta's operating table and started wheeling it into another room. Let's get you cleaned up, he whispered to my sister. 
when they were gone. Grandma Pat came over and gave me a big hug. I fooled you, didn't I? Yeah, I admitted. That cut looked so convincing. Together, we walked out of the room and started heading back toward their house. All the neighbors walked with us. Grandpa ran out of the back room to catch up with us and explain that Greta would be back soon. He was just washing off the fake blood. When we reached the house, all the neighbors congratulated my grandparents and then wandered back to their own homes. Then the three of us walked inside without Greta. Grandma offered me some tea that she'd already brewed. The three of us sat at the kitchen table. I was about to drink from my cup when I noticed that both my grandparents were staring at me. It was like they were waiting for me to drink it. I knew it was unbelievable, but I sensed that they were trying to poison me. All of this was real. They weren't playing a practical joke on me. That was just what they said, so I let them finish off Greta. My sister really had been hurt, and now they wanted to do the same thing to me. I set down my tea and said that I needed to use the bathroom. Grandma Pat looked suspicious. Drink your tea first, she ordered. Just give me a second, I said, trying to act like nothing was wrong. I rushed into the bathroom where I pulled out my phone and called the police. I told them the truth, that my grandparents and their neighbors were involved in some sort of harvesting scheme. I told them I wasn't safe here. The policewoman on the phone didn't say anything at first. Then she scolded me for making a prank call and hung up. Grandma Pat pounded on the door. Let me in, she screamed. She wasn't going to stop. Eventually, I said, okay. Then I casually pushed open the door and walked right past my grandma. I acted like everything was fine, like I completely believed in their wild lies. Then I started running. I shoved past them, opened the door and raced out into the street. Another resident had left his golf cart running, so I jumped in it and drove off. The driver ran after me, screaming, but I was too fast. It didn't take me long to get to the police station. Now that the cops saw me in person, they could tell that I wasn't pulling a prank. They took my statement and asked me a bunch of questions. Then, they took me back to the retirement community so I can show them the operating room where Greta was taken. When we got there, all the evidence had been removed. A few of the neighbors came over and gave their statements, telling the police that I had made everything up. Both my grandparents came over and said the same thing. They said that Greta had never been there. The police left after that. I still didn't know what to do. All of this sounds so crazy, and I can't find anyone that will believe me. I don't think I'll ever find Greta again, and I'm worried that my grandparents and their whole community will keep kidnapping people and stealing organs. Someone needs to stop them. The first time the roses appeared, I was just about to leave for work. I was running a little late, so I practically tripped out of my apartment and slammed the door, almost trampling on the beautiful bouquet of flowers sitting on the mat behind me. I blinked in surprise at the mysterious gift, glancing down the hall as if expecting to see someone waiting for me, but I was alone. Crouching down, I picked up the roses and searched for a tag or note, but there was nothing. Whoever had left them there clearly wanted to remain anonymous. The flowers were sweet and fragrant. At least a dozen of them with blood-red petals and leafy stems. Knowing I would be late for work regardless, I unlocked my apartment and headed back inside to put them in water. If only I knew who they were from. The second time the roses appeared, dusk was already falling outside. I was lounging in my apartment after a long day of work when I heard someone knocking on the door. It was more like scratching, like fingertips scraping against wood, so I peered through the peephole first. At the very edge of the corridor, I glimpsed a shadow disappear around the corner, a flicker of movement and then stillness. With a frown, I unlatched the chain and opened the door, stepping out. The corridor was empty, but another bouquet of roses were sitting on the mat. It was only a couple of days since the last one. I knew Valentine's Day was right around the corner, but... I wasn't seeing anyone, and I had no idea who could be leaving these roses for me. I was simultaneously pleased and unnerved by their appearance, especially after seeing that mysterious shadow. 
Someone clearly didn't want me to see them. But why? Eh, shaking the thoughts away, I reached down for the roses, wincing when I pricked my finger on a thorn. Blood immediately welled, staining part of the stem red. Great, I muttered under my breath, trying not to focus on the soft sting in my finger. Well, at least the thorn hadn't gotten stuck in my flesh. That would have been painful. Throwing one last glance down the hall, I hurried back into my apartment and locked the door, careful not to touch any more thorns. These roses smelled less fresh than the last ones, with some of the petals already wiltering, but they still smelled sweet. I put them in the same vase as the others after cutting some of the stems, setting them on the cupboard in my open sitting dining area. Well, they at least added a splash of color to the otherwise drab looking apartment. Still, not knowing who they were from bothered me. I wish they'd at least left a note. A week before Valentine's Day, I got my third bouquet. I was at work when one of the office administrators, Mary, came over to me holding the roses. Liz, look what you got, she said excitedly, thrusting the flowers into my face. Someone left these at the front desk. It has your name on it. I quickly snatched them out of her hand and looked for the tag. But the only thing it said was Elizabeth in printed script. Still no sender's name. Did you see who left them? I asked desperately. Mary shook her head, shrugging cluelessly. Didn't see. When I came back from my break, they were just sitting there. Did anyone see who left them? Mary's brows furrowed. No, I don't think so. Why? I sighed, putting the roses on my desk. The petals were crumpled browning around the edges. This is the third bouquet I've got this week. I just want to know who keeps leaving them. Oh, that's romantic, Mary said, but I shrugged. Maybe, unless it's some stalker, I mumbled. If they knew where I lived and where I worked, it had to be someone who knew me. But who? I threw a vague glance across the room. It couldn't be any of my co-workers. None of them had ever shown interest in me, and most were already married. Who else could it be? Mary left, and I stared at the roses. A slightly putrid smell wafted from them, like they'd been left in a dark warehouse for a while. I hesitated for only a second before tossing them into the bin. I didn't need this many roses, especially from some stranger. I just wish they would reveal themselves soon. A few days later, I was jolted awake in the middle of the night by someone knocking at my door. I sat up in bed, bleary-eyed and groggy, staring into the darkness of my room. Outside, the pale crescent of the moon silvered the windowsill, shadows creeping along the walls. The apartment had gone silent now, but the echo of the knock still rang in my ears. Was someone at the door? I threw back the covers and climbed out of bed switching on a lamp as I shuffled past. It was just past midnight, far too late for a visitor. Unless it was an emergency. Maybe one of my neighbors needed help. Stifling a yawn, I switched the light on in the hallway and walked up to the door, checking the peephole. The corridor outside was empty. Something strange tugged at my stomach. A little bit of fear mixed with apprehension. Who had been knocking? Had I just dreamt it? But part of me knew that when I opened the door, something would be waiting for me on the mat, just like all those other times. I swallowed, freezing, with my hand on the doorknob. I could wait until morning to check. It was late, and I was working early tomorrow. In the end, I gave in and opened the door. As expected, a bouquet of roses were sitting on the mat outside. This time, the roses were half dead. Some of them were withered and curled, their brown petals breaking off when I picked up the flowers from the floor. There was a sharp, tangy smell rising from them, like old soil and roots. Like the last ones, they would be going straight in the bin. Why would they leave me rotting roses? It was starting to creep me out now, since I was still no closer to figuring out who was behind it. I couldn't even tell if the gesture was supposed to be romantic anymore, or something else. I retreated back into the apartment, locking the door and sliding the chain through the latch. 
the thought of someone visiting my apartment in the middle of the night didn't sit well with me. Maybe I should set up a camera or something. That way I could catch whoever it was in the act and confront them about it. I tossed the roses straight into the trash and went back to bed. Valentine's Day finally rolled around the following Wednesday. I hadn't received a bouquet of roses since that midnight drop-off a few nights ago, and I had hoped that the whole charade was finally at an end. I was wrong. When I got home later that evening, after spending all day burying myself in work, I knew that something was off. The door to my apartment was sitting ajar, shadows bleeding out into the hallway. Fear clenched my gut as I approached the door, breathing shallowly. Had someone broken into my apartment? There was no way I would have left it open like that, even if I had been in a rush that morning. Swallowing back the lump in my throat, I walked up to the door and slowly pushed it open with my fingers. Inside was dark, and it took a second for my eyes to adjust, but I couldn't see anyone. Instincts told me to call the police before I did anything rash. But I didn't want to waste their time if it turned out to be a false alarm. Instead, I pushed the door open wider and stepped inside. The entire apartment was silent. Nothing stirred. Since I was still close to the door, I switched the light on, letting it flood out into the open kitchen dining area. There was one change that became immediately noticeable to me. The roses I had kept on my sideboard were gone. Instead, a single bouquet sat in the middle of the kitchen table. The petals were a dark, grimy brown color, and the stems were twisted and broken, black thorns sticking out. The flowers were rotten. I took a step closer and almost gagged on the smell. They smelled like something that had been left in the dark for too long. Something putrid and sick. What the hell was going on? Who had left these here? Had they broken into my apartment? That's when I noticed the note sitting beside the flowers. Pinching my nose, I walked over to it and read the black script. I barely read the words when the door behind me slammed shut and something hard hit the back of my neck, sending me to my knees. The rotten roses were the last thing I saw before my mind faded to black. This is what you did to my heart, and it's what I'll do to yours. I was told I'd be shaved. All the way from the top of my hair to the sole of my feet. Cleanly shaved. My lashes and brows would also be clean, and my toenails would be clipped and covered with a special type of material to make them softer and accommodate me into a new type of life that was possible on the other side of the portal. Any extremities on the body poking out of my flesh when I poured it through the machine was dangerous to myself and to the mission. It's like being born again, Dave, Mr. Rosenberg said to me. Mr. Rosenberg insisted human beings were yet to find the cure for the sundry illness because we were looking at the symptom of an event rather than checking for the source of it. Children, he said, were the most important element to look out for in solving most of the world's problems with illness and disease. He alluded to the biblical Christ. Humans did not need sex to reproduce. It was all the work of an alien civilization populating our species. If it wasn't so, every time humans had sex, a child would be born, he argued. I didn't care for his argument, so I let him go. But humans are too soft to the needful, and we fawn over those little beings, seeing ourselves in them and wishing to protect them when we should be protecting ourselves from them. The children who come to the earth through the belly of their parents, with hairs or nails on their body, are impure beings transported from other realms to ours, and they bring their filthy diseases with them. Mr. Rosenberg insisted that he had submitted papers with evidence documenting what he was talking about, but nobody had cared to listen. So he had turned his attention to something far more convincing, time travel. The machine was a gray pod with a post on each side and a sliding bar over the door so that once one was inside, only someone from the outside could turn it open. 
Mr. Rosenberg said it was better that way because the aliens could figure he understood how time traveling through birth works, and they would try to destroy his machine if they knew exactly where it was. How the machine worked was unsophisticated. He had a button to turn it on and a button to turn it off. It was so simple by design that a complicated civilization would struggle with accessing it. He mused, genius. He applied some foul-smelling material to my nails and guided me into the pod. It was then that I started to feel uneasy, asking myself if it was all worth it. His offer was good. He had $500 for anyone who would go into his pod, see into a different time, and come back with a testimony of what it was like. I had a plan of my own. Mr. Rosenberg was a madman, but he was a madman with money, money which I needed because times were hard. I had concocted the most elaborate story of a future time when houses were made from a material that could disappear upon command and still be present enough to house residents. It was a time when people did not need cars, and they could port anywhere they wanted and as much as they wanted. It was this plan that consumed my mind as I stepped into the pod, and found myself adjusting into a comfortable spot with Mr. Rosenberg outside, shutting me in. Once I was shut in, the machine started to drone, an ear-pinching noise that made me dizzy. I put my hands over my ears to remove the assaulting noise from my senses. Then a strange sensation overwhelmed me. It was a change in the smell inside of the pod. It smelled nothing like oxygen. It was heavier in the nostrils and I struggled to take much of it in. I panicked, terrified at the thought of suffocating in the pod. I had never been claustrophobic before that moment, but in that small time, I was transported to hell itself. I wanted out of the pod and I banged on the door forcefully. The crude smell of the air lingered, and the more I struggled to breathe, the more I suffered. My beating heart thudded slower and slower until its echo in my ears turned faint. I had no awareness of the time and place, and my limbs were at least a hundred times heavier than my senses recall them to be. My limbs dropped to my side, and my knees buckled, I slumped in the pod and held my breath longer one final time instinctively. My eyes drifted close and I heard the pod being opened from the outside. I had felt all of the dizzying effects of the machine, but when the pod was open and fresh air came back to me, I enjoyed some invigoration. In a bid to make my testimony more believable, I was in no haste to speak to Mr. Rosenberg. I simply remained as I was eyes shut and limbs relaxed. Mr. Rosenberg spoke without trying to wake me up, and I had never felt as chill as I had in my life when he confessed his true intent. I hope you taste better than the last one. He mummed close to my ear as he bent over to pick me up and dumped me onto his trolley. My blood ran cold in my body as I pondered on what he could possibly have meant. I only wanted $500. Mr. Rosenberg rolled me in his trolley into a freezing room as I continued to play dead, and what I saw confirmed the worst horror I could have imagined when I heard his words. He dumped my body on the floor, and I slit my eyes open to the sickening view of another neatly shaved human with a portion of his chest cut off. I threw up in my own mouth as the stench of bloodied flesh sunk into my nostrils. Aha! I heard Mr. Rosenberg say with the accompaniment of blades clanging. My heart almost burst out of my chest from how horrified I was. The pace of my blood pumping through my body offered some internal warmth in the cold freezer. Mr. Rosenberg's gloved hands grabbed my shoulder and he turned me over. He suddenly had the eyes of the devil himself, black and utterly evil as he held that knife over me, ready to kill me off for his cannibalistic enjoyment. I wasn't thinking clearly when I reacted. I attacked his hands bearing the sharp knife and slammed it up against his face. The pointy end of my blade missed his face by inches, but jammed into the more fatal area of his neck. You were not dead? He muttered, choking on sputtering blood as he fell to his knees. He clutched the air and cried in agony as the knife in his throat drained him off his blood. 
I could hear his dying cry when I was searching for my clothes, but I did not stop for a moment. The event was so jarring that even as I escaped from certain death at the hands of Dr. Rosenberg that day, I still cannot shake the thought of how foolish it would have been to be murdered over a promise of $500. People love to preach to me about how much money I could save if I stopped buying coffee so regularly. I tell them, look, it's in the budget and I'm lazy, so to Dunkin' Donuts I will go. And I'm just saying that Dunkin' is relatively cheap compared to their competitors. All the workers at my local Dunkin' know my order. There are still times when they get my drink wrong, but mistakes happen. Especially when you're in that drive through as much as me, there's bound to be a mess up once in a while. You could think getting the wrong order is the worst thing that could happen to you in the drive through but it's not like that. A couple of weeks ago, I was on my way to work and stopped to get a coffee. The line was unusually long that day. Cars snaked around the entire building and stretched through the parking lot. There was only one space for one car before the line started to peek into the main road. Looking at the line, I knew it would make me late to work. It wouldn't have been my first time late because I was getting coffee. Sometimes I sneak in and no one notices. But this time, since the line was so long, I texted my manager that I was running late. I told her I would make it up to her and the team by bringing all of us donuts. She said, Okay, but don't be too late. We have a meeting at 9.30. I pulled into the line and got as close to the car in front of me as possible. My small sedan fit perfectly in the amount of space left in the parking lot. I was surprised a car tried to pull it behind me because they would be sticking out into traffic. It was a massive black truck, and instead of four wheels, it had six because it had double back wheels. He pulled up behind me and laid on his horn. I looked in my rearview mirror and he motioned for me to move up. I turned around and tried to mouth politely, I can't, and shrugged at him. In response, he laid on his horn for longer. Still turned around and looking at him, I was in disbelief. He revved his engines and made the same hand motion, instructing me to move forward. I shook my head at him and turned forward. The line was bound to start moving here soon. The man continued to honk and rev his engine. What was he going to do? Run me over in the Dunkin Donuts parking lot? He saw that there was no room for his car, but he still chose to get in line. It's not my fault he's sticking out into traffic. Finally, the line moved forward, and all the cars pulled forward, leaving enough room for this man to pull into the parking lot. You would think this would be the end of his antics, but no. The guy continued to rev his engines behind me and honk him. He started to yell at me, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. It became so obnoxious, I flipped him off. He really didn't like that and revved up his engine in response. I wanted to tell him to chill out. The line kept moving. The guy kept egging me on. I was confused about what he thought he was accomplishing. Anyway, I reached the front of the line, paid for my items, and was happy to get away from that guy. I pulled out into the street and started to drive away. It wasn't long before I checked my rearview mirror and saw the massive truck tailing me. One of my friends had a road rage incident that ended with him getting stabbed so I was nervous to drive straight to work. Would he return around the end of the business day? Would he try and jump me if I got out of my car? At a stoplight, I texted my manager what was happening and she gave me a pass on our morning meeting. I drove around for another 30 minutes and this guy never let up. Sometimes, he'd switch lanes when we would come to a stoplight to glare at me while he revved his engine. After another 15 minutes, he finally took a turn and I lost him. Once I couldn't see him, I headed to work. Throughout the day, I couldn't stop thinking of him. He was so persistent and aggressive. I kept going over how it wasn't my fault there wasn't room in the parking lot for his car. I was pulled forward as far as possible, but he still got so angry. When I went to leave for the day, I heard the rev of an engine and jumped. I scanned the parking lot for the back truck, but it turned out to be my coworker starting his car. The entire ride home, I kept checking the rearview mirror for the truck. One car seemed to be following me, but he took a turn at some point, so I assumed I was just shaken up from the morning. The rest of my day was normal. I went along like I usually do. I made dinner, watched some TV, and then went to bed. Around 2 a.m., I woke up to the sound of a revving engine. I got out of bed to look out my window, and 
The truck was there, parked in front of my home. He was flashing his brights and revving his engine. Not sure of what to do, I called the police. They said, since he hasn't done anything directly to you, there's not much we can do, but we will send some guys there to get him off your back. When the police rolled up, the guy sped off. I went out and told the police what happened, but again, they told me there wasn't much they could do unless a crime had been committed. I thought that would be the last I saw of him, but it wasn't. He returned the next three nights just revving his engines and flashing his brights. I called the police each night and was told the same thing. He stayed out there for hours. I had no idea how none of my neighbors called to file a complaint. After the fifth night, I decided I had enough. It seemed like all he wanted to do was scare me, but he wouldn't do anything to harm me. Like he was all talk and no walk. I called the police to see if they could send someone to shoo him off, and they said yes. Since I knew the police were coming, I went outside to confront him. I walked onto my driveway and yelled, What is your problem? He stopped revving his engine. He opened his door and stepped out. He was a big, bald man wearing a thick leather jacket. In his right hand, he held a baseball bat. You are everything I hate about women. He sneered and started towards me. He called me a bitch and yelled other bitches at me. I retreated back into my house immediately when I saw the baseball bat. He trudged up to my front door and started pounding on it. I was scared he was going to break it down. It was stupid of me to think confronting him was a good idea. He went to the window beside the front door and used the bat to shatter it. I ran to the kitchen to grab a knife. I kept telling myself the police would be here any second. He slowly stomped through the house. I sat on the floor of the kitchen holding the biggest knife I had, praying the police would show up. As he was about to turn the corner into my kitchen, red and blue flashing lights filled my home. I thought I was in the clear, but this made the man speed up. He whipped around the corner into the kitchen, grabbing by my hair, and lifted me from the floor, causing me to drop the knife. You annoying little he growled. The police ran in, armed with guns. They demanded he let me go. Since all he had was a baseball bat, he listened. They put him in handcuffs and took him away. The cops gave me his information so I could get a restraining order just in case he ever tried anything again. They told me the road rage incidents can get out of hand, but this was the worst they've ever seen. I never saw that black truck again, but I pray for the next person who flips him off. The pizza smelled great strong enough that I perceived the cheesiness from the closed box when he handed it to me. The wafting aroma made my stomach growl, beaten empty by long hours of drinking booze alone in my room and binging on TV. I was distracted by him when I opened the door to a man with glasses over his eyes, black hair slicked back into place by gel. He was a most curious looking person. His heavy set eyebrows were unforgettable. He was clean shaven, neat around the mustache and the beard. His pants were a straight-cut cargo pants with pockets all over it. He had a pair of sneakers, dirt-stained and greasy, I assumed, from working long hours in delivery. He had a charming appearance, even though he didn't smile too much. I was affected by my assessment of this pizza delivery man that I didn't realize how strange it was to just stand there, in front of my door, looking a stranger straight in the eye. He cleared his throat and it was only then that I shook myself from the reverie. That'll be seven, he said, tapping the box of pizza to take my attention away from himself. I scoffed, flailing my hands in the air to dismiss the inconvenience. I'm sorry, I was... I blubbered, and the words trailed into silence. I flipped the cover open, and the smell intensified. My mouth watered as sweet savor washed down my senses. I shut the box and shoved my hands into my pocket. Oh, I think my wallet is in my room. He smiled for the first time since our interaction and told me it was fine. I rushed back inside to fetch my wallet. The dark room enveloped me, and I only found my way towards my desk when it occurred to me that I had inadvertently left the door open to a stranger. The loud bang of my heart leaping in panic echoed in my ears, and I struggled for coordination as I placed my pizza on the desk. I sighted the wallet, snatched it, 
with the same motion that I spun around. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. I was speaking when I noticed the stranger no longer stood at my door. My inebriation cleared, and I shook my head to concentrate on what this absence could possibly mean. Hello? I stuck my neck gingerly out of my door and stared this way and that on my floor. My call reverberated off the walls and returned to me. I swallowed carefully and pushed the door shut. I found myself lost in thought, pondering what had just happened. I attributed it to being drunk on an empty stomach and had possibly imagined all of our interaction. However, I was certain I hadn't imagined it. The lingering smell of pizza in my room confirmed my clarity. I muttered a cuss at my own sluggishness and made a mental note to pay it forward if I ever came across a pizza delivery person from the same pizza making chain. Strange, I said, rubbing my hands together as I made my way back to the desk. I sat facing my computer and tapped on the play button. The audio came on at once, as did the movie on my screen. The shuffling of feet, baffling, sudden motions which I did not reconcile from what I was watching caught my attention from the dark room. I held my breath and waited out the curious noise. What's that? I said, the veil of my own lack of sobriety billowing with suspicion. I sensed something move in the room, but it was too dark to notice and I had too much liquor in me to investigate such an inconvenience. I moved a chair from the desk and ambled around it to sit down, when I heard a more confirmatory sound of movement other than mine in my own room. My palm grew sweaty and my breath turned raspy. It's been years, a demure voice called from within the room, sickly and wheezing. The fog of inebriation came and went as I struggled to place the voice, utterly refusing the thought that it was the pizza delivery guy who I suspected had a strange face that had been led into my room. He started to laugh, and his laughter startled me. I edged closer to the desk, perceiving a strong presence coming from where he was speaking from. Get out of my room, you coward! I shrieked. He did not budge. <laughs> Such a blood-curdling, ear-peeling laughter of terror that made me shiver right where I stood. How the evening had spiraled from an innocent need to quench the hunger in my stomach to dealing with a mysterious horror in human flesh stupefied me. I debated running to the door to call for help. I turned my leg in the direction, but it occurred to me that moving from where I stood meant that I left myself vulnerable to his attacks. Since I moved here, I haven't felt so much vitality in a person, he said, finally stepping out of his hiding place beside my couch, and he started to make his way towards me, hands held out. I'm gonna enjoy seeing the life going out of your eyes. He was a much different man now especially under the glow of the light from my screen. His eyes were more sinister and white, searching unceasingly. His arms were vein-stripped and sturdy. He wiped his brows and rushed straight at me. He caught my neck and squeezed my Adam's apple. The crushing pressure of his fingers on my pipe made me squeal. Ah, yes! He cried in a frenzy. His eyes were wider and crazed fueled by his own powerfulness subduing me to a fatal end. My life flashed before my eyes. I was dealing with a serial killer who was unhinged on his power trip. I sputtered and tried to inhale. He locked my throat with his fingers. I blacked out and returned to consciousness with adrenaline pumping through my veins. I wrestled him off me, but he was strong and clever. He continued to laugh in my face, relishing my struggle for oxygen. As a matter of last resort, I struck him on the crotch with a powerful kick. He recoiled, releasing his grip on my throat, and I seized the moment to escape from him. Come back here, he groaned from the floor. I should have brought my knife. I was out of the room in a breeze. I made sure to keep the door locked, and with a stroke of luck, my neighbor walked in my direction. Call the cops, I hollered grasping my hands on my chest. He did as I asked. The moment still reeled in my head as I pondered how terrifying it was for me to be moments away from being killed by a crazy pizza delivery person. The cops came and tased him before effecting their arrest. 
but I knew to never be so vulnerable ever again.